Welcome to the Data Science Seminar. We are very proud to announce the 25th edition of the Data Science Seminar today. It's my great pleasure to welcome Philipp Richter Pichanski. He has a strong linguistic background and works as a researcher and domain expert in natural language processing and clinical data science in the group of Christoph Diederichs at the Klaus Chira Institute for Integrative Computational Cardiology and the Cardiology Department at the University Hospital Heidelberg. Today, Philip will talk about natural language processing in the clinical domain. The stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Doreen, for the kind introduction. Yeah, I'm very excited uh, today um, to take part in this um, data science sessions. And um, I want to give you an introduction to the domain of natural language processing um, in clinical routine. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah. Um, so the topic of, the, of today um, will be, as I already said, natural language processing. So we will look at the data format text. And uh, in today's presentation, I want to give you an overview about our current project. And at the end, I want to show you as well some concrete results we actually achieved um, using um, yeah, currently state-of-the-art NLP methods. Before I start, I want to give you a quick overview about today's presentation. So after a short introduction and some important definitions, we will have a closer look at the data we've been using. Then um, I will outline our used methods and we will define actually our final objectives where I will show you the results. And after that, we will sum up and um, I will present you as well current challenges in NLP and our future work plans to solve these. So while structured reporting in the healthcare domain is an emerging field, still most of the data is stored in unstructured format. Natural language processing tries to extract relevant clinical information from these texts and, and we um, then finally want to store it in a structured format so that uh, clinical routine and um, research actually can um, process these data in their pipelines. In Heidelberg, we therefore focus on um, clinical entity recognition and text summarization, basically for data preparation and clinical information tasks. So now I want to give you some a you know, short overview about our current projects we are doing at the Dietrich Lab. And um, so we are, um, yeah, um, we, we've seen a huge progress in NLP, especially with the rise of deep learning in the last decade. But um, if we compare it to the um, uh, domain of clinical NLP, and especially if we have a look at the German clinical NLP, and we see that this is still in infancy, this domain. Um, and the reason is because experts actually have, yeah, just have limited access to the clinical text data and um, because it contains patient uh, sensitive patient information and um, we have to always um, follow um, data protection regulations. This is the reason why in Heidelberg um, we intensified research on computer edit de-identification um, where our goal is to um, find patient sensitive information in the letters and then uh, uh, pseudomize or blind these information out, which are not then uh, needed for any further tasks like clinical information extraction. We um, as well presented two of our um, approaches at recent uh, conferences. And in addition, uh, we are focusing on clinical information extraction, such as uh, cardiovascular concept extraction. Um, here, we focused on creating data sets and um, training machine learning models for automatic uh, extraction, uh, concept extraction. And here, we focused on medication information, cardiovascular risk factors, and anamnesis information. In parallel, we are developing a DFG-funded uh, MIDI framework, uh, framework uh, to uh, rapidly create training data um, for these kind of methods. And uh, here we are currently conducting projects for annotation of uh, with cardiovascular concepts, medication extraction, and document segmentation. Today, we want to focus on two methodologically very closely related tasks. So this is on the one hand, de-identification, and on the other hand, cardiovascular concept extraction. So both tasks are actually um, part of so-called named entity recognition. And here our goal is to seek and classify phrases 
containing like patient names or patient addresses or clinical entities like drug names or any kind of cardiovascular concepts. In case of de-identification, we are focusing on the um, part of, um, of uh, um, seeking and classifying patient data in the texts. And this is, these are so-called patient health information token. And we um, are using, or we are basing our um, work on the US data protection regulation, because in comparison to the European GDPR, this has a much better and more precise definition of when we can consider a clinical text de-identified. And as well, as you've seen already, we are using the term de-identification. So this is like the most general term. And you will very often hear as well, anonymization or pseudonymization. Very often they are um, used synonymously, but actually they are kind of different concepts. So our technical approach, what we will show here today is generic and thus it can be adapted to the European GDPR um, with um, legal advice. On the right hand side, we are focusing on cardiovascular concepts, our second task. And here we are, we want to extract 12 cardiovascular concepts we um, selected with our clinical partners. Um, so something like angina pectoris, dyspnea, syncope, nycturia, or diabetes mellitus. So to get a bit more concrete, let us have a look at some snippets I just um, uh, created um, representative for our discharge letters. So in case of de-identification, you see here we want to, for example, seek the sequence Max Mustermann and classify it with a, lab, with a PHI tag, so personal health uh, class person. And our clinical use case is here, as I already said, that we wanna um, make the data more accessible for NLP and deep learning experts. And thus we wanna first remove these, uh, the ident um, these uh, personal health information. On the other hand, we have cardiovascular concept extraction. And here you can see, for example, that we wanna seek the sequence starke Druckschmerzen auf der Brust and when it classifies then uh, with the cardiovascular concept angina pectoris. And our clinical use case would be here, for example, that if we would, if we are able to annotate and um, discharge letters uh, with these kinds of concepts, we could, uh, for example, uh, build cohorts. So we could ask the data set, um, give me all patients which are suffering angina pectoris and are smokers, and at the same time uh, have the risk factor hypertonia. So. Before I will continue um, showing you the deep learning methods we've applied. Um, let us first um, uh, have, a, um, have a short look at the term supervised learning, which you will most mostly um, already know. But uh, in context of NLP, I want to show you just a quick example how this can work um, with, uh, if you are working with text. So on the left side, you see a text snippet containing um, yeah, like a sequence of text. So starke Druckschmerzen auf der Brust, five token. And here we um, are meaning implicitly angina pectoris. And we take this as our input data X, and then um, we input this into a, condition, um, into, um, a machine learning model. This is our feed forward process. So this uh, model is now at the beginning just randomly initialized with some kind of parameters. And um, this doesn't matter, it is not trained before. And we just input that now. And um, then finally, we will get for each word um, some kind of a confidence score and a cardiovascular concept prediction. So as you can see here for the three first words, so starke Druckschmerzen auf, the model is already quite confident that this is, these words are belonging to the concept of angina pectoris. Um, less confident is with the words der Brust. Here we see between 14 and 70%. And so the, um, what we need to do now is we need to optimize the model's parameters and this we are doing by the back propagation process. So we go back into the model and we are um, using optimization theory here. And practically this is very often gradient descent, for example, a very famous method here. And um, we are now adapting the parameters in the model um, depending on the error rate of the predictions. So yeah, if the error rate is larger here, for example, like for the last two token, we have to adapt a bit more than for the other tokens, of course. So 
we can see here that we can now do this kind of process iteratively um, as long as we are actually achieving kind of a sufficient optimum for us. But it doesn't matter actually now um, what kind of model we are using here in the middle. The most important thing is here what I want to show you that we need, the, if you have a look at the right hand table, the second column, which contains the labels. And these labels are needed for the model to calculate an error rate or a confidence uh, score. And this means that the supervised machine learning methods can be just applied on clinical text if we have annotated text available. So in this case, we need a discharge letter where a clinical domain expert annotated each word with these kind of concepts. So this is called manual annotation, and this is um, a critical um, a part in any kind of deep learning um, uh, training in a supervised manner. So let us have a look at the data now. In total, we have at the cardiology department around 200,000 discharge letters, and they cover a time period between 2004 and 2020. These letters we find in a clinical information system, and they are typically stored in a Microsoft Word format. In case of de-identification, we, um, we chose stratified sampling to select 113 letters of these, of this big corpus. And then we um, let clinical experts annotate these letters with personal health information, like patient names and birth dates. And in total, they contain 110,000 tokens or words, and uh, 5,200 of these tokens contained actual patient information. On the right hand side, you can see our cardiovascular concept extraction uh, data set. Here we chose um, 204 um, discharge letters and we um, selected just the anamnesis and the cardiovascular risk factor section in these letters because um, here physicians did the annotations and they, uh, yeah, of course, had a lot of time restrictions. So in total, they contained around 380,000 tokens and just um, 4,000 of them are actually containing cardiovascular concepts. So let's have a closer look into the annotations here for our cardiovascular concept data set. So you can see that in total, um, 1,600, around 1,600 concepts had been annotated by the annotators. So here we are talking about concepts as such a, contact, a concept can, such an annotation can contain several tokens. So it can be uh, one token, two tokens, three tokens. So in, in total, we have 1,600 at all concepts. And mostly they annotated dyspnoe and gena pectoris uh, here typically in the anamnesis sections of the discharge letters. And um, if we have a look at the right-hand side on the histogram, you see that approximately eight till nine um, cardiovascular concepts have been annotated per letter. So now let's have a look at a very interesting attribute, especially for these kind of data sets. So you can see here kind of a sparse heat map, let's say. And um, on the x-axis, you see um, the amount of tokens. So from one token to 25 token. And on the y-axis, you see the cardiovascular concepts, the 12 concepts we chose. And then you see um, in the color scale, the distribution, the length distribution per concept. So let's take an example. If you have a look at the angina pectoris concept, you see that, for example, 52% of the annotated concepts contained two words. So most uh, probably this will be like explicit um, uh, 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 annotations. So like there will be angina pectoris in the letter or pectangliose beschwerden or something like that. But as well, you can see that we have a high variance in the length of this uh, concept, especially, but as well, if you have a look at dyspnoe or edema or palpitation. And this means that this angina pectoris can be a quite long implicit description. And we can have a look now here. And I just chose some uh, representative examples of these annotations. So on the one hand, you see shorter annotations like typische AP. So this is an abbreviation for angina, angina pectoris or um, three words like angina pectoris beschwerden. And on the other hand, we have quite implicit and long contexts here, uh, which the um, physicians annotated because they implicitly read, okay, this patient suffers angina pectoris, like for example, the sequence, Druck auf der Brust verspürt zu haben, welcher in den Rücken ausstrahlt und mehrere Stunden angedauert habe. So the challenge for a machine learning model is now to extract actually the 
semantical information behind these uh, words and uh, assign it correctly to the concept of angina pectoris. So let me uh, give you now a short overview about our methods. Um, so on the first line, we of course wanted to compare these deep learning methods um, to already well-established uh, methods uh, we are using in text uh, processing NLP already. So um, I don't want to go into the details, but this is basically um, our baseline is based on a conditional random field. So this is a statistical machine learning model. Um, it considers the context of each given input token, which is very important in NLP. And it uses a so-called predefined set of feature functions. So we need feature engineering. We need to define these feature functions uh, to run such a statistical machine learning model. And finally, it is trained using log likelihood um, to train the weights for each feature function. So how important are these feature functions? The possible feature function would be, does this word contain a, a capital letter, for example, which would be important if we are searching person patient names, for example, because they are most probably written with a capital letter in the beginning. Now let's take a step back. Um, in NLP, actually, the most important and a very crucial uh, part is representation learning. So what does that mean? First of all, if we are processing text, we need to convert this text in kind of a numerical representation. Otherwise, we cannot process it in our deep learning models because they are bait based uh, on uh, calculations and uh, numerical um, uh, uh, inputs. And this is the reason why um, yeah, we just have to find a way to represent um, kind of any yeah, word in a numerical format. So this is typically done in a kind of a vector format. And uh, if we look at machine learning models, statistical machine learning models like the support vector machine, or what we've just seen, the conditional random field, we are using so-called feature vectors to represent a word in our case now. So we are inputting a word, and then we are creating such a feature vector, which has just the dimension of all the features we are defining. Yeah, so it depends on us yeah, how much features we are defining. Let's say you define 10 features, so the vector will have the size dimension uh, 10. And then you are just assigning to each of the dimensions in the vector a feature function output. So for example, if you input here a word which contains digits, so yeah, kind of a, um, a simple uh, feature, you, we will now um, in the first position assign this feature and then uh, we will flip here if we take it in a binary format and um, this to a one. And we do that for all the rest of the features. And finally, we will have a feature vector in a numerical representation as a representation of the input word. So on the other hand, especially with the rise of deep learning in its early days, as well, they appeared another very important um, representation um, for a word, which is called a one hot vector representation. So what does that mean? So basically deep learning models, especially in the beginning, the idea was that a vanilla model, actually you don't do any pre-assumptions. So the model itself should extract the features it is using or it, it considers important. So this is very different to the first representation where we've seen where a human actually defined features where the model should focus on and the deep learning model should do it on its own. So we, we needed to find a way to represent the words just that as less as possible pre-assumptions are in it. Um, and here we have the one hot vector representation and these are created like that. So we have a vector again with the dimension of the vocabulary size. And this you can get if you look at your corpus, you want to apply your model on, and then you just count the unique instances of any kind of words which appear in this model. And um, the amount of words, of unique words, is then the dimension of this one hot vector representation. So you can imagine this can be quite large. Um, so here, this is the dimension then. Just for an example, let's say the word nicotine consume, you assign to the first dimension in the vector. So you flip this to a one, and the rest of the entries of this whole vector will be zero. And so on for each word, you will have then such a vector with just a, a one dimension with a one and the rest will be zeroed out. And now you can think about that some disadvantages appearing here. So first of all, you have a really a sparse representation. I mean, if you can think about vocabularies, they easily have something like 10,000 or even 100,000 or even millions 
of unique words. So you will have a huge vector representation, a huge input vector, which will make your model as well larger because already the input layer is so big. And on the other hand, you don't have any kind of um, semantical, syntactical, or contextual information in these kind of representations. Because think about them in a vector space. So you will see that all the vectors are equally distant apart. So you cannot see any kind of similarities between words which could appear. Yeah? For example, um, if you focus on fruits, yeah, orange and apple should have a vector representation, which is maybe more similar than um, uh, orange and uh, a computer, the words, a uh, vector for it. Yeah? So this is all not possible with this one hot vector representation. So let us um, have a look now as a very groundbreaking um, publication, which has been done by Benjo in 2003. So we are talking about word embeddings now, which um, some of you maybe had heard of already. So here we are trying to represent words in a distributional representation. So we are um, going away from the sparse representation where we actually just have one dimension with a non-zero value and we want to um, uh, it decrease the amount of the, the dimension of the vector. And here are word embeddings. So let's say we have here a word dimension, a vector dimension of let's say 150 or 300. We want to now um, optimize and we want to use all the dimension entries in the vector for this representation. So let us have a short look at how these word embeddings have been actually created, because then you can maybe get an easier understanding of it. So I am just choosing now one of the possibilities how you can create word embeddings. There are several possibilities just to get an impression on it. And uh, let's focus on the skipgram method. So, and here you can see we have a neural network with three layers. So we have an input layer, we have a projection layer and a hidden layer, and we have the output layer. And our objective is now to train such a model on in an unsupervised manner, thus we don't need annotations. Yeah? So we just train it on a huge amount of text. So this could be, for example, the whole Wikipedia um, in English or in German. So we input every word into this model now, and uh, then we, in, we represent in the beginning in the input la um, uh, layer, each word in a one hot rec vector representation as I already showed you. Yeah? So this is a large vector with just one dimension um, representing the word. And now we are projecting, uh, we're making a linear projection of this large um, one hot vector representation into a lower dimensional space. So here we have our V. So this is like the, the, the vocabulary size. So it can be something like 10,000 or 20,000. And then we are just linearly projecting it to a lower dimensional space, the dimension of our hidden layer. Yeah. So this projection layer here. So this can be, let's say, 150 or 300. In this layer, then we don't additionally do anything. So this is just this projection. And here, um, typically in your neural networks, you would apply some non-linear function like, um, I don't know, sigmoid, some activation functions. But this is not done here. In the next step, we take these projections and do um, linearly project them again to the output layer. And here again, this dimension of the output layer is the size of such a one hot vector. So and the reason is, here we are applying a so-called softmax function. So we have a vector, and in all the dimensions, we have a distribution, a probability distribution. And we can see now where in, on the position where the probability is the highest, this is the predicted world of the network. And this we are doing all the time now in an iterative process again. And finally, if, if this model is trained um, uh, sufficiently, we will just use this middle projection, because here in this 300 dimension or 150 dimension layer, our word vectors will be stored. So they are appearing in this projection. So we are cutting that out and we don't use anymore actually the rest of the network. So this was kind of a um, fascinating um, uh, um, yeah, idea um, which uh, yeah, Benjo had actually to, to train such a model and then just to cut out a part of it and here your models are appearing. Uh, your uh, word embeddings um, are appearing. So this kind of um, uh, representation, of course, helped a lot. And there are very famous um, applications of it. So it was possible to now um, have these vectors um, which are semantically closely related. And you will have ex vector representations, which you will see in a vector space closely related to each other. And this, um, of course, 
um, made it easier for a deep learning model, which uses these word vectors and uh, these word embeddings as representation uh, for any kind of training. So it already has some knowledge about the word. Yeah. So it is implicitly in this embedding, some semantical knowledge is stored. So of course we had some disadvantages. So think, of, uh, think about um, some homonyms. So words um, which can be, have different meanings. So in English, this can be the word can or the word rose, where you can think about, you have just one word embedding representation for it. So there won't be two. So you won't, uh, um, you cannot distinguish different meanings of these words. So um, you can just input them always in the same style. And in NLP, we have a very important saying. It says the word is characterized by the company it keeps. And this has, is a very important saying because it actually says everything about our language and how language is working in a way. Yeah? So you always have to think about the context. There are even languages existing where um, you, for example, don't use any vowels. So you just have consonants as words. So for example, in the Semitic languages like Arabic or Hebrew, and here you always have to think in the context and then you can fill in the vowels by yourself. Yeah? And um, this makes uh, very easily um, uh, clear how important this context is actually for a meaning of a word. And here now in 2017, we've seen another groundbreaking um, a development which really changed a lot in how NLP is working now. Um, the idea was we um, seen the rows of so-called pre-trained language models. So what does it mean? So very important instances or famous instances are here, for example, BERT or ELMO or the GPT model. And um, such a language model tries to involve context into account. So instead of representing a word now as a single word embedding, we use a whole deep learning model for representing an input sequence. So you, you always input a whole input sequence into this model. And then the model assigns to each of the input words a representation, a numerical representation. But it does that by looking at the context always. Yeah? So not just by the single word, but always look what are the rest of the input words. So and this, of course, makes language models quite of complex. So you can see here on the right hand side um, a representation where um, yeah, some um, language models are um, listed here, like the distal bird or the bird base, bird large. Don't be confused with the words now. So these are just different architectures of pre-training such a language model. And you can see here some kind of an exponential um, uh, uh, um, development lately. Uh, if you have a look at the amount of learnable parameters. Yeah? So always you have such a deep learning architecture with randomly initialized parameters. And your goal is to learn these parameters as they are fitting to your data set. And of course, if we have a look at the GPT-3 model, for example, which uh, became quite famous because it, yeah, um, for example, is able to write on its own some journalistic articles um, about the quality you can discuss, of course, but it is kind of impressive what it is able to do. And here we are having already 170 something billion learnable parameters. So you can think about in our clinical NLP infrastructure, we most probably won't be able to train such models anymore. But that was not important because if you already have a look at these like hundreds of millions learnable parameters here, like the BERT model, these models already outperformed in other NLP tasks, state of the art results. So our goal was now to evaluate such a BERT model on our clinical data. So if we chose here, um, yeah, so easy to assess and uh, um, a, a famous uh, BERT model. This is developed by Google um, in 2018. And this is based on the architecture, the deep learning architecture, it's called transformers. Um, yeah, which um, yeah, became very famous recently in NLP, but um, uh, slowly as well in different domains, uh, you will find these kind of um, uh, architectures. Um, the most recently as well, the GANs, so this um, generative adversarial, sorry, um, networks, and um, they are as well using transformers now um, very often. So previously in NLP, we used so-called recurrent neural networks. So here, we have a sequential processing of the input. So this neural network took always one word after another uh, as input. And the transformer is a back of words approach. So here we are uh, inputting the words in parallel and as well processing the words in parallel. 
And to do that, such a transformer has a method of so-called self-attention. So self-attention is to compute the similarity scores between the words. So what could be an application? Um, think about co-reference re resolution. So here our goal is um, to, to find out co-references in a, in a sentence and to which nouns they are actually um, uh, um, looking at. So for example, you have the sentence, um, uh, Jim lives in Hamburg, uh, he is uh, 20 years old. Then our goal is to find out what this he is actually pointing to. And this is obviously pointing to the, to the noun Jim. And the self-attention helps you to, to understand these kind of relations between the words. On the other hand, we want to train positional embedding. So this is kind of a way how this transformer tries to again um, understand the word order. Yeah, as I already said, this is not a sequential input, it's a parallel input. It just got all the words, yeah, and the order is not important at the beginning. And now this transformer model uses the so-called positional embeddings uh, to get this order into the um, uh, input sequence again. So what is very important, so as I already said, the rise of these pre-trained language models, like for example, BERT, um, really totally um, changed the um, way how NLP methods are applied, how they are working. Because, um, yeah, this pre-trained language model, this pre-train is a very important um, uh, term here. And um, we are having two distinct workflows now, the pre-training and the fine-tuning. Fine-tuning, I will explain you in a second, but the pre-training is working the following way. So you're having an unsupervised task. So um, you don't need annotated text. That's always nice, yeah? And because this is easier, yeah? text you have most probably um, available, but not manual annotations. So um, you take such an architecture now, randomly initialized again, yeah, like the BERT model. And um, as a data set, you use, for example, the whole Wikipedia dump or something like that, whatever you have. And now you're training such a model with an objective of a language model. And very simply spoken, this is something like predict the next word given an input sequence. So if you have the input sequence, Joe Biden is, then the um, a task of the model is to predict president, for example. Yeah? So this is a language model objective. And this can be easily done. Yeah? You don't need to annotations here. You just have to input the, the whole text. Yeah? And then the BERT model will always uh, make another task, yeah? uh, take some input sequence, and then predict the next token. And we'll have a look if it is right or if it is not. Yeah? And then as, as the parameters will be adapted. So finally, after such a training process, you will have then a pre-trained pre language model trained with a BERT architecture which is basically yeah, understanding how Wikipedia language is working. Yeah? This has to be said yeah, because, of course, this, the, the model learns the language of the input data. Yeah? So if you um, give it, an ex for example, in the next step, um, the Bible as an input, most probably it won't perform that well. Yeah? And here, now on the right-hand side, you have the next workflow, which is the fine-tuning part. So here we are having a supervised method. So we again need annotated data. And this is a critical point here because be this language model already has an idea of language, how, how language is working, yeah? what syntax is, yeah? what grammar is somehow working is on. And here we can um, use this knowledge. And because of that, we can have smaller training data because now on the training fine tuning part, it can focus really on the task we are inputting it in. So for example, we are looking here at a, a text um, um, classification tasks. So our task is we want to input a sequence of words, aktiver nicotine consume, aktuell zwei bis drei Zigaretten pro Tag. And we want to classify such an um, uh, input sequence into these three um, uh, distinct classes here, non-smoker, ex-smoker, smoker. And so our goal is now we take the BERT model and to represent all the words and we are inputting now from our discharge letters. And then we stack on it a classifier, a simple classifier. It can have any kind of architecture. It doesn't matter so much. And here we are just training it now on our smaller training data um, on where it has labels and annotations and it can learn from it now and yeah, to uh, perform this kind of task. So important to uh, remember here is always, or to keep in mind is 
in NLP with this uh, language model training, we have a pre-training step and we have a supervised, a supervised fine tuning step. And the supervised fine tuning step is typically the thing you will take most, uh, you will spend most time with because here you are um, yeah, applying your annotated texts and then train your classifier for your specific task, what you are and um, what you had in mind. So let us define now the objectives here actually to see some concrete results, how this actually can work these pre-trained language models for our clinical NLP texts. So the goal is to train and evaluate anti-recognition models, so seeking and classifying phrases, using German pre-trained language models. On the one hand, we have de-identification. So here we want to um, use a pre-trained German BERT model to fine-tune the model on the task to recognize PHI token in our German discharge letters. And on the other hand, we have cardiovascular concert extraction. So here we are using pre-trained BERT model to fine tune um, the model on the task of cardiovascular concert extraction. So you see how handy it is actually, you can use such a BERT model now for your task, what you actually decide. Yeah? So it can be the edification, but it can be as well cardiovascular concert extraction. That solely depends on the smaller annotated input data, what we created. Yeah? So let's have a look at results now. So as I already said, we are using a conditional random field. And here we are um, yeah, um, using that as a baseline to compare it to our pre-trained BERT model results. So in test sets, we are using a fourfold cross-validation traditionally for de-identification and cardiovascular concept extraction. And as metrics, we are using the F score, so the F1 score for cardiovascular content extraction and the F2 score for de identification. The F2 score or the F score in general is the harmonic mean between precision and recall. And the F2 score is giving more um, weight to the recall score. So the recall is here more important in de identification. What does that mean? So we prefer to de identify. Uh, um, uh, personal health information token, uh, and sorry, we, pre we prefer to de-identify a token which does not actually contain personal information by um, instead of um, not de-identifying a token which contains personal health information. Yeah? So we want to have the recall as high as possible. And then it's okay for us to have some false positives where we actually have the identified word which didn't contain patient information. So, and the F score in general is used for this entity recognition task very um, often because it handles this uh, issue with the unbalanced data sets. If you remember in the introductory slides, you've seen that, for example, the data set for cardiovascular concert extraction consisted of 380,000 words, and just 4,000 are actually containing cardiovascular concepts. So, we have to handle a lot of true negatives. And if we would, for example, apply the score of accuracy, you would easily see that, um, yeah, um, if you take a model which uh, assigns to each word a negative label, this model will have most probably more than 99 point something percent accuracy. Um, but this is not sufficient for us, of course, because this is not the important uh, thing what you actually are looking for. So as well here, very important always when you are defining your task, think about the scores you actually want to uh, um, use for it because they have to be representative. Yeah. So what score you want to optimize? Yeah. So uh, accuracy score will be most probably already perfect in the beginning without any training. So now let's have a look at the results. On the left hand side, so you, so you see the results for the de-identification task. Here I'm using the F2 score, and you can see that our BERT model um, over most classes um, outperforms our baseline already. If you have a look in more detail, especially for these uh, classes here, person, location, or organization, you see that the BERT model performs quite well. And you can see here that um, all these three classes are kind of variant, so they can contain anything. Yeah? So person names is like, oh, it's, it's hard to create a list with all possible person names. Yeah? And so it obviously looks like that our BERT model, which is so context sensitive, somehow performs here um, best, yeah? So it's uh, in comparison, so for example, for the um, salutation or for the zip code class, yeah, the difference is not that big. So already our CRF quite well performs, yeah? Still bird model is a bit better, but if you could, it's, uh, if you have a look at the significance here, then especially these classes are uh, uh, important for us now here. So, and if we have a look at the cardiovascular constant extraction, you see um, a similar behavior. 
So the conditional random field um, is outperformed by the BERT model over most classes, and especially in classes which are, yeah, what we've seen in Jana Pectoris, yeah, which is very long sequences sometimes, is implicit meaning. So somehow the BERT model here already um, uh, um, yeah, uses its pre knowledge, yeah, about how language is working here to uh, get such a better uh, uh, results in comparison to the CRM. So how can we sum up these kind of uh, outcomes? So first of all, the less complex conditional random field, our baseline, achieves already promising results, though we use the small data sets. Um, yeah, you can, this conditional random field can be, um, because it's statistical machine learning, it can be easier to reinterpret it, yeah? And you can fastly train it, such a model on our data set, you can train on uh, 20 seconds or something like that. So this is really fast. In comparison, such a bird model is trained in like one or one and a half an hour. With our IT infrastructure, of course, this is depending on that. Still, our language model outperforms the baseline in de-identification and in cardiovascular constant extraction, even on our small training data set. And this is a very crucial point here, because in earlier days, deep learning models always needed really, really huge annotated training data. Otherwise, you couldn't not really apply them. And now with the use of this pre-training, you can now um, um, actually focus on your downstream task like the identification and create a specific data set just for that. And it can be much smaller than it has to be. It had to be. So what you can see now, our hypothesis is as well um, that in this, the smaller training data, as well as um, uh, possible in the clinical domain now specifically, because our discharge letters are somehow semi-structured. So such a discharge letter always contains an introduction and very often contains a diagnosis section or an anamnesis section and a cardiovascular risk factor section, a summary. They can be um, written a bit different and can be differently positioned, but somehow there is some semi structure in it because the physicians are working with kind of a copy and paste workflow very often. Yeah. So, um, of course, um, our models are um, uh, um, uh, using this kind of uh, structure already um, to remember basic contexts. So, of course, as well, we can say that these classifiers, which are trained now on our local data set, most probably won't perform that well on other clinical data sets. If we have a look now at the clinics in, I don't know, in other cities or even in other departments. Um, but here now, um, it came, um, you've uh, heard already a, 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 a very exciting talk about this federated learning. Yeah, so here we can um, uh, get in touch with the possibility to train local models. Yeah, and then um, if it is possible to distribute these models then via federated learning. Mm -hmm. So another point is um, that these local annotation pro pro um, uh, um, uh, projects are really more feasible. Yeah? You can easier conduct such projects because you need um, uh, less time. Yeah? You have to, um, of course, in the beginning, you have to activate or you have to find your annotators, you have to train them, but still it's possible to um, uh, make annotations uh, in, let's say, a few weeks and not a few months or even years if you are talking about 10,000 discharge letters or something. And um, this makes it more feasible just to, to conduct these projects. So what are the challenges? Of course, we have to say that still extending the data set, of course, would make the uh, models more robust. So 113 letters is really not a lot. And uh, most probably, um, they will become as well old, you know, because the style how discharge letters are written changes over the years because the physicians are changing. And then it is helpful to add some letters to the data set always, yeah? But you don't have to do that in such a huge amount that it is just not possible to fulfill. And another point is that our neural approaches are harder to interpret, yeah? In comparison to um, conditional random fields or support vector machines. And this is like a black box. And there's a, a vivid research here um, how to interpret your machine learning models, because especially in the medical domain and the clinical domain, this is a very important fact. Physicians want to know why this model made this and that prediction. And, but here, uh, yeah, we still have to do a lot of research because um, uh, there is not an out of the box solution existing so far. Yeah. Just to come back to the data, yeah, because we've seen we have data driven methods here. So the data 
um, a, a very famous uh, deep learning expert, um, uh, Anvion Gu. Uh, I am not always not uh, uh, sure how he is pronounced rightly, um, but uh, he just said again, the community, the deep learning community should focus more on the data in the next time. We, we created such great architectures, deep learning architectures, very complex, and uh, we we hyper and we 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 tune the hyperparameters and everything on on them. But actually, the most easiest part to improve the performance of your model is mostly by improving the input data. So you have to focus on that. And this is the reason why we are uh, conducting now in our um, uh, Dieterich lab here currently um, a framework. We, we are creating a framework, an interface. It's called VDeep, um, um, Medical Information Extraction, using deep learning. It's DFG funded. And our goal is to involve clinical experts more in this process, because already in the data preparation part, um, we need this clinical expert information, because otherwise the model can just learn what it is input. Is. And here we want to involve the clinicians into the preparation of data sets, into the annotation and into the model optimization process. And to increase the annotation speed, we want to improve, of course, um, the um, uh, annotation, uh, the, the way how the um, uh, physicians or the clinical experts are um, annotating. And here we are using um, a, a state of the art technologies like data programming, weak supervision, or as well active learning. And another very important fact, and the reason why actually, yeah, clinical NLP, especially in the German uh, uh, area, is so still in its infancy, is not just that the, um, uh, the, uh, the de-identification problem, but as well, I mean, of course, this is the reason of it, uh, we don't have shared corpora. So the NLP community typically works like that. So somebody distributes a shared corpus. So it creates a corpus with some annotations and then just uh, um, uh, re releases that to the community. And now um, different NLP teams can just build their models and then they can compare which model performs best. And um, we cannot do that until now in the clinical domain, but we wanna change that. And um, our goal is now to publish a data set containing 500 German discharge letters from the cardiology domain to make it like of a, um, performance uh, a corpus, so others can uh, as well um, uh, reproduce our results. So all these scientific back best practices, which are not uh, possible till now, um, uh, can then be applied on these kind of uh, data sets. Yeah, so this is already the end of my pres today's presentation. So um, uh, I want to, um, of course, um, uh, thank very much um, the valuable input I got from my colleagues uh, in the um, Dietrich lab. And uh, on the other hand, um, what we've seen, we are uh, dealing with data-driven methods. So our clinical partners are really very important here and we have to involve them more. Um, here I namely want to thank Benjamin Meda, Nicolas Geis, Ali Amel, Dominic Schwab, Christina Kriakau, and Sebastian Bender. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you very much, Philip. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Because I had some problems with the muting. Yeah. Thank you very much again. It was a really impressive um, insight in your work. And it's, I think, really necessary word. Um, so before we start with the question from the chat, I would also have a question. So what changes could be implemented in the clinical documentation workflow to best facilitate NLP to medical data? Yeah, this is a very important question. And of course, yeah, here um, is a crucial part. So as I already said, currently we are working with this uh, clinical information systems. They are very often kind of out of date. Yeah, so already since decades active. And then we have to deal with this um, uh, Microsoft Word uh, formats and um, uh, to, to improve the, uh, the yeah, this um, a kind of um, yeah, API. Yeah, so the the, um, the possibility, the interface between our models and the data, we of course have, uh, our goal would be um, to, to improve the representation of this data. So this can be a structured reporting. Yeah, so we have um, here as well, especially in the HiMed consortium, we are trying to implement uh, such uh, workflows. Yeah, where already the physician is actually in a structured format, somehow um, uh, processing the information he's uh, getting from the patient. Okay, so 
we have a question from the chat. So it's um, with pre-trained word to vec models. They are probably effective in text classification of mainstream language, but are they really effective for medical text classification? Um, and the author writes, I tried Google's Gensim for classifying medical abstracts, but the similarity scores for medical voc vocabularies are not good enough. I found BioWord VEC, which seems to be working well, but I think we need more pre-trained word to VEC models for medical vocabularies. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, because um, yeah, it involves this uh, this um, this uh, information what I uh, just said when explaining the bird model. Um, of course, these language models are learning on the text you input. Yeah, so if you put Wikipedia input, then the model thinks that Wikipedia is German language. Yeah, and uh, this is representative. Yeah? Of course, if you would input now Twitter's uh, tweets, yeah. Um, you would most probably get some uh, issues here. Um, he, he's talking about now, or she is talking about a word to vec. So this is kind of a word embedding representation. Yeah? So here we have to take a step back. These are not pre-trained language models, yeah, but uh, pre-trained word embeddings. And uh, here we have the same problem, of course. And um, I uh, can uh, fully um, uh, um, confirm his results. Yeah? Um, if you are training a model, on a, a, a word, your word embeddings on a non-clinical non domain, then most probably um, they won't perform uh, that good. But here is an important, uh, so we, we did um, intensive experiments here. So for example, if we are looking, let's focus now on the uh, language models. If we look at the pre-trained BERT model, this BERT model is trained on around 14 gigabytes of text, the German BERT model, which you can download. Yeah, it's uh, published from a, a, a startup here in Berlin, and uh, you can just freely download it and use it for any kind of tasks. And um, this uh, BERT model had seen really a lot of text. And our idea was now, OK, we have our 200,000 discharge letters. Let's train the BERT model on this kind of text. So purely our discharge letters. And here we had around 2 gigabytes of free text. And we found out that the BERT model um, which is publicly available over in both tests outperformed our locally trained discharge letter bird model. And the reason is that it is still not enough language, yeah, it, it, not enough uh, data. Yeah, so two gigabytes is still not sufficient, obviously, for our bird model to get really an understanding of the grammar. And uh, here, really, a lot helps a lot. Yeah, so if you have, you, you, if you want to train such a bird model, if you look, it's, it, it contains like 150 million parameters to learn. So it really needs a lot of data yeah, to, to somehow adjust all these parameters properly. Yeah? And um, we tried as well another approach. This is the so-called um, language model fine tuning. So here we took the publicly available BERT model and gave it in addition to its knowledge it already had. Um, in addition, it, we, gave, we inputted our discharge letters to it. Yeah? And here, indeed, we've seen that at least this model um, somehow um, is comparable to the um, not uh, to the to the publicly available BERT model, but the improvements had been slightly, and just for some classes, and so not in general. We couldn't as well say here that uh, this model outperforms the publicly available BERT model, yeah, uh, which is trained on any kind of data, yeah, like this is basically trained on Wikipedia. I know it because they published their work. And um, here, I mean, in Wikipedia contains a lot of clinical text as well. And there's a lot of cardiological text. You see that when you have a look at the vocabulary, as I said, yeah, every uh, deep learning model uses a vocabulary. So it knows a set of words. Yeah? And um, if you input then words, which it had never seen before, it will not be able to represent it properly. Yeah? So it has to uh, impute something. Yeah? Um, but obviously, in the cardiology domain, we didn't have such a huge problem with this unknown word um, uh, things, yeah, because it has seen quite most of them we have been using in our cardiovascular documentation. But it's a very important step, and of course, the larger um, the the the, um, uh, the corpus would be, yeah. So this two hundred thousand letters is not sufficient, but that doesn't mean that maybe if we would be able to get um, uh, much more data, then most probably it would help. In the English um, NLP, clinical NLP section, we have such models already. So this is called BioBird yeah, or clinical bird. 
and there is a discharge bird even published. Yeah, so they've been they in the English clinical domain you have these shared corpora. Yeah, and so they've been able to train these models on publicly available data. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the answer. So I would go on with the next question. What is the benefit of using deep learning for CCE compared to simply having a manually gen generated set of identification phrases that map to disease? And in other terms, how consistent is the description of diseases in doctoral letters if the variability of the description is low and the number of signal words is limited? It might be easier to create a translation map. Could you please comment on this? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, um, uh, as well, a very good question. So here we are coming uh, to the point of as well the, yeah, I mean, a doctoral letter is a way how you can, um, yeah, there are ways to interpret a doctoral letter because a human wrote these letters, yeah, and um, some uh, are um, uh, reading it a bit different. I had a very important, I had very uh, interesting review round. So we had these physicians who annotated these kind of concepts. And we've got very interesting discussions between the physicians and because the one said, no, I understand it a bit more like that. Yeah, and the other understood it a bit more another way. So it was very interesting to, you know, we had to write guidelines for these annotations. Yeah, so that both annotators are actually annotating the same style. Yeah, And so here, of course, yeah, which this is always the thing if you are um, uh, uh, yeah, um, documented, if you are documenting in a free language manner, that um, there's always a, a way of interpretability. Yeah, so this is never a distinct information. And um, uh, this is the reason why um, it is so hard to capture that by any kind of mappings or rules. Yeah, because yeah, it is really high variance in it. And uh, we try to solve this now with this deep learning models. I mean, this deep learning model does nothing else than trying to understand these two physicians, how they interpret cardiovascular concepts. And it does not do more, but it doesn't do as well less. Yeah, this is very interesting. It is just to, we, we want to find a way to get more robust models. And the rule based approaches or mapping approaches till now just given, uh, did, did not give us a sufficient result. Still, um, they are very imp important, and I don't want to. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, remove them from our pipeline yeah still they are um, uh, th this is like an addition just yeah it is um, we want to combine these methods yeah to make a strong um, uh, uh, prediction thank you there is another question so i would say if we could hurry up a bit then we we have four questions um in some so i would start and maybe we can go through this four then uh, we can finish in time. Mm -hmm. So the question is from me, Retu Kebede. I hope to pronounce it well. So how about in a heavily imbalanced data set? My data is hugely imbalanced, 5% versus 95%. I used upsampling and downsampling strategies. The upsampling method results in overfitting. What is your opinion on this? How large could the data be to apply deep learning? Is 400 observation enough, 200 by 200, the loss by class labels? I mean, for the training data. Maybe if um, the answer would take too long, we can also, um, yeah, I could connect you and you could um, share this answer by, by email or maybe by a direct contact if you want to. Yeah, indeed, it sounds like a very exciting experiment. Um, um, it is a quite of a complex answer I would like to give here, yeah, because it it um, it, it involves a lot of uh, uh, different information, yeah. Um, so maybe that would be a way. But just shortly speaking, I mean, this imbalanced data sets, yeah. So um, as I if, as I just presented with our named entity recognition, we have that very often, yeah. This is. Uh, not a specific problem, actually. We have our technologies to, to cope with that. Yeah. So because in a text you want to identify patient names. So most probably most of the words won't be patient names. Yeah. So we have really imbalance in it. And um, uh, this is not uh, from the beginning a problem for a deep learning model or even not a statistical machine learning model. Yeah? It really heavily depends what you want to do. I've heard now numbers like 400 samples. It sounds more like text classification or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's, this is why I would need to know that. And uh, here, of course, uh, you have to, yeah, that's getting a bit more problematic then because with such a low amount of 
training or test data, your results might be quite biased then. Yeah, and that's good possible. Yeah, but yeah, indeed, it's it's hard to go into the details, you know. But nice to hear that somebody is involved in that. <laughs> Thank you also on this. So Tim Adler asked, do you have an explanation or hypothesis why the BERT model performs worse than DRF on the task of familial anamnese in slide 20? Yeah, that's a perfectly fitting question here. And, uh, and indeed, the interpretation of why different concepts Actually, the bird model didn't give us any um, additional, um, uh, um, yeah, um, better results. So, in the case of family and anamnese, um, I did a look into the data and into the annotations, and this family and anamnese is indeed kind of, um, yeah, typically just a one-worder, family and anamnese. So it's a very explicitly written, most most often in the discharge letters, and so our conditional random field actually is quite well finding that yeah so uh, we do it in this specific concept our huge deep learning approach was not like needed yeah in this case <clears throat> thank you then we have um, another question question how much time is needed on average for an annotator to annotate a stinger discharge letter are the annotators doctors yeah, very good question. And we are trying to measure that always. Yeah, it's uh, not uh, that easy, but of course it depends on the task of annotation. So what do they annotate? But in context of cardiovascular constant extraction, for example, um, indeed two physicians annotated here um, because yeah, you've seen this implicit information. So this is very helpful for us that physicians who actually write these letters are trying to annotate them. And uh, here they took around three to eight minutes per letter. That was very varying, yeah, because in some letters it's just less information than in other letters, but uh, around this, we, yeah, um, ended up, yeah, in this. But it depends heavily on the complexity of the annotation task. Yeah. So this is as well important, don't make it too complex because with this too complex, you won't, most probably won't get high quality annotations because the annotators already are. Yeah, I mean, there as well humans. Yeah, you always have to watch out. Yeah, that it's clear and that they can concentrate on things. Yeah. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. the last question for today: Is it possible to use the methods that thread today to develop uh, to develop a clinical ontology? A clinical ontology. Um, I mean, I, I I'm I'm not sure about um uh, the, the the idea behind it. Um. I mean, it's like a clinical ontology is a way of a structured representation of clinical terms, yeah? And uh, you try, and um, sometimes they are, they are used to, to, to do some kind of mappings and this stuff. I mean, yeah, straightforward, that wouldn't be that easy. It's not like that's done for that, but of course in a, like a workflow or a process it can be involved, but that's yeah, going too far. That would be, yeah, a, a deeper discussion. I hope, yeah, somehow I, I got this uh, question right. Otherwise, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, um, I could send you the contact or the person could contact you directly. Mm -hmm. That would be the best way to do. All right. Yeah, we are at the end of our seminar today. Thank you very much for this impressive talk. And yeah, for the audience, thank you also very much for listening. And you can later on watch our video and our, uh, on our YouTube channel. And yeah, thanks again. Have a good time and stay healthy, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.